The views of this program are not necessarily the views of KJLL Radio, its management, or its sponsors. The host is solely responsible for its content. Enjoy! On a mission given to me by Woody Shaw, Sunship, Dizzy, and Billy Higgins, dedicated to pursuing a piece of our cultural heritage through interviews with my jazz heroes, this is The Jake Feinberg Show. Welcome, everybody, to The Jake Feinberg Show. Saturday afternoon here and taking a break from uh, jazz, my jazz heroes today. And, um, you know, a lot of people have written about the Grateful Dead lyrics meanings, biographies, statistics, cassette generations, but not all of them make sense to this host. And my guest today is the most lucid writer when it comes to all things Grateful Dead. He got the opportunity to write the definitive book on Jerry Garcia entitled Garcia, An American Life, which provides an inside baseball look into the lives of the dead and their large family. I read this book almost every day when I worked as a jazz clerk at Tower Records in Boston. He also writes a blog on Dead Net entitled Blair's Golden Road. Blair Jackson, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Thanks, Jake. I was hoping I was one of your jazz heroes. <laughs> well, you know, you, maybe at the end of the day, uh, you will be. I don't know. I, I, uh, you moved to the Bay Area in 1973? Yes, I and, moved, uh, moved there. I'd lived in, I grew up in the suburbs of New York and saw my first uh, Dead shows back there at the Capitol Theater in Port Chester and Fillmore East and Yale Bowl and Roosevelt Stadium and other obnoxious places like that, and then came out to sunny California and have been here ever since 73, you know. So actually you had already been seeing a lot of incredible music back on the East Coast before you even got out to the West Coast. Um, but, but I was thinking, you know, I I can't imagine a, a more hipper scene than San Francisco in 1973. And I, were you were you into psych, were you in the, to the psychedelic rock or were you also doing jazz at the workshop? Were you, where, where were you checking out? Uh, I was mostly mostly seeing, I guess, what you'd call psychedelic rock. I don't know. That, that was sort of the beginnings of, uh, I wouldn't say the beginnings, but there were also a lot of interesting uh, sort of country rock bands that were around the Bay Area, around there. Uh, Asleep at the Wheel, who are now, in, of course, in Austin, were in the Bay Area, and Commander Cody. So there's a lot of kind of interesting sort of hippie-ish country rock that I like to. And, you know, I, I did see occasional jazz stuff, too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. How, how did you... Uh... Did you know the band, the Grateful Dead, uh, back uh, in your days in New York? Or? No, I didn't actually meet any of the band members until later when I was working. Uh, I, what happened is I, in 76, I started working for a fledgling Bay Area uh, magazine called BAM, which was a free music magazine that started out in the Bay Area and then eventually went statewide, and I was an editor for that for many years. And that's, uh, It was through BAM that I originally first met Garcia and first met a couple of the other members. And really not until I started uh, the Golden Road magazine in the uh, mid-80s, 84, actually, that um, I sort of got to talk to everybody <laughs> eventually. So, right. So, yeah. It's great. I mean, it, I, I didn't actually realize that you were editor of BAM magazine. That That is quite uh, amazing, really. It was, a, it was a cool magazine. It was a lot of fun to work with. It was, it, was, uh, it was pretty big at the time. You know, a lot of pages came out every two weeks, so we were sort of right on top of the scene of everything. I interviewed so many people for that. I mean, just, you know. I did very little Grateful Dead stuff for BAM, actually. <laughs> but, but, you know, I talked to Tom Petty for a number of different stories, and Stevie Nicks, Lindsey Buckingham, Carlos Santana, all the Starship people, uh, just sort of everybody who was around. Wow. And then, and, uh, and could you put in, con- in sort of uh, encapsulate what the scene was like? I mean, that was po- post uh, Haight Ashbury, post sort of uh, the, the co- uh, cultural awareness movement of the 60s, but by 76. What did San, Fran- San Francisco still had a kind of a, a, a hip feel to it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, because, uh, like, I mean, the Starship was really big at that time. They were just coming out with Red Octopus in 75 and 76 and uh, uh, Dragonfly and stuff like that. And Santana was kind of peaking in, in their own way uh, during that time. I don't know. There were, there were a lot of uh, sort of more commercial bands that I didn't care for, people like Journey and uh, 
you know, Night Ranger, some of these late seventies guys who were really useless in my opinion, <laughs> but, but were but were very no, no. popular. Dude, we're joined by author Blair Jackson. So, um, Blair, t- t- set the scene. How did you like? Was that first meeting with Garcia a memorable one, or was it just sort of happenstance? How did that work? It was. It was almost happenstance. Uh, I was working for for Bam. I was managing editor, I guess, at that point. By that point, uh, and um, he. Well, maybe I wasn't managing editor yet. Maybe I was just like reviews editor or something. Anyway, it was at the end of 1977, and we had a really, really good two-part part interview with Garcia um, that was done by a writer, local writer named Adam Block. It's a really, really good thing. I hope it comes out someday in its entirety because it's really good. Um, anyway, uh, Jim Marshall, the famous uh, rock photographer, was assigned to shoot the cover session for for BAM, and so I went along sort of as BAM's representative, and it was down at... Um, uh, uh, the Front Street Studios, you know, where the Grateful Dead uh, sure. practiced and all that kind of stuff. And I had never been there before, and I had never met Garcia before. <laughs> so we go, we go there, and it was, it was very funny, because Jim Marshall was like this totally irascible, obnoxious guy. But, you know, he knew Jerry all the way back to like 1966, and so they already had a kind of funny right. uh, sparring relationship and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. So they were kind of jabbering back, back and forth. And I, I didn't really, you know, I'm not sure Jerry got a hit off me, particularly that day. Um, I didn't actually get to interview him until 1985 after I started the Golden Road. So, uh, yeah. Well, let's talk about that for a minute because, um, you know, we're, we're not we're going to go back to uh, my, my my heyday of 79 to 84. But in 85, you interviewed him in 85. Um, how extensively had you been touring up to that point? How in touch were you with where the band was at uh, uh, psychologically? Oh, I was very in touch with the band by then. Yeah, all the, I knew all the dark corners and uh, all the good stuff and all the bad stuff by 1985, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd been seeing them since 70. My first show was at the Capitol Theater in 19, March of 70. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think I once figured that when they came back from their retirement in 1976, I'd seen them like, I had only seen them like 30 times or something like that by that point. Um, but I saw them a lot in the early 80s, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, Beginning in 81 is really when I started going to a lot of, a lot of shows, mostly because they started playing cool places. I mean, they played the Greek Theater in 81. In 82, they played Frost Amphitheater. They played Ventura for the first time. So there were a lot of kind of cool California shows, uh, with, and I was living in the Bay Area. Um, up to that point, I had not gone. I would not go to see the band like in Stockton or Sacramento. <laughs> right, right, right. Stuff like that, which I would have done a couple of years later as I became more and more obsessed the, and certainly the, doing the uh, writing the, the book, The Music Never Stopped, uh, in 82, and then doing The Golden Road starting in 1984 definitely uh, made me uh, an even more intense fan than I had been and also forced me to keep up with things even more closely than I had. I mean, I was a guy who before that was not really you know, studying what they were playing night to night, particularly on a tour, um, but then I did. <laughs> by, um, you know, we... In, in my mind, again, this is just through re- your reading and stuff like that. It seemed to me that um, it's such an appropriate, the Golden Road, it was, uh, it's almost a 20 year anniversary at that point. And, um, but, you know, I'd be, I'd be lying if I, if I didn't think that there was a, a real feeling that this thing might end because Jerry was, was on a crash course at that point. And, you know, I, I'm wondering from, from your perspective, um, you know, what, was everybody in the band feeling that way as well? Or was there this idea that, I know people... In 1984, 85? Yeah, and by, when you first interviewed him in 85. Yeah. He, you know, that was what I was going to ask you, is that he, he, seems, he seemed almost oblivious to his physical appearance. He seemed completely secure with himself. Yeah. Was Jerry Garcia insecure? What was he insecure about? I have no idea. You know, I mean, he, he might have been insecure. Uh, he, you're right that he seemed to have no regard for his physical appearance. None. And, um, you know, that, that first day when we interviewed him, Regan, my wife and I, um, you know, it was kind of a depression scene. Uh, it was rock ballet sort of around, and uh, it was definitely the, the depth of his uh, drug degradation era, I would say. Um, but, uh, you know, Jerry was sharp, sharp, lively, funny, and, uh, you know, he might have been high, but I always he wasn't high. Um, but um, he's really engaging and friendly and warm, but the things that are amazing. And uh, I know, I, I, I think it's been 90 percent on my education. And um, he's always fantastic, always smart, always funny. Uh, one of the most attractive people I've ever dealt with. And, you know, he knows something about everything. I mean, he's just one of those really sharp. Um, so it's almost like he, you know, I have no idea what he was like, what exactly he got out of the oblivion of, of junk or whatever. Right. Um, <laughs> and he, 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 uh, I remember in your book, uh, you talked about they were copying the video and, for, and Jerry's first response was, well, if I, if I do that, I've got to do Jerry Garcia, video first. And it's like, you know, to me, it would just be the intense amount of the weight of that, those crowds night in and night out to wait to get off because they're waiting for your guitar player. And that is, is, is a style, I remember that in your book, and that came, that's from the book with that immense pressure. And I, and I was just wondering if you, if you knew how he used to escape, whether it was art or whether it was 
super guy, you know, he went through stuff that people didn't know. And, and so I think of all those things. I think, uh, you know, he's a really bad guy. I mean, he has pressures on him at all times. Some of them self created, probably. Uh, you know, I'm feeling like he was sort of, uh, you know, he tried to develop it, you know, knowing that he wasn't back to the captain of this, this thing, <laughs> um, whatever it was. And, um, you know, and having a responsibility to that. And then you, you, you put on top of that the responsibility of, of, of the whole Grateful Dead organization, which became this giant behemoth of marketing people and, you know, his family and friends and, you know, people who had been dragged along with them since 1965 and people they picked up along the way <laughs> and road crew. And, you know, it was just this giant, enormous machine. And, and, and in, uh, I think in a lot of ways he felt responsible. For that, that weight was on him. And uh, I think he responded to it sometimes appropriately, and sometimes, you know, he did it by, you know, getting wasted and, for long periods and, and, and trying to escape that way. Uh, you know, I, I have no, I have no, uh, I have no personal uh, experience with heroin, so I don't exactly know, you know, what it was, what it was or did that uh, allowed him to feel like that was a good escape from the pressures of his life. But I think he did. I think that's that's what everybody says. Yeah, I, I'm amazed at his uh, being around musicians myself, you know, young musicians who are still trying to cut their teeth. And you realize that after a while, um, just to be able to be so secure with yourself, the whole band was was pretty secure when they were up on stage. Yeah. Um, but, you know, especially he just let it all, he was letting it all hang out. And that's why I love that. What I love about the early 80s, uh, being a huge fan of it, is that it was not pretty. Aesthetically, it wasn't pretty. But yet it was like the the visceral underbelly of the beast that would occasionally rear its head and roar. And to me, that speaks to hu human human mankind, whereas some of their stuff in the early 70s, while it was, you know, 21 minute eyes, 30 minute eyes, it was very it was too beautiful. It was too it was too happy. There was no mistakes. I like flaws. So that's sort of my my rationale. But I have a question for you. You, st you said you started seeing them extensively in 81. I, I'm, I'm glad you uh, this segues into the question. If the dead we're playing at the Aladdin Theater, for instance, in Vegas. Right. The concert venue was essentially in the hotel room or the casino, and I was curious, how much interaction did the band have with, with, with Deadheads and people before or after shows, and was this accessibility something that endeared them to their fans? Uh, I think it depends on who you're talking about. I think, <laughs> I think, no, seriously, I mean, I think, uh, I think Jerry, in particular, had as little contact with fans as possible. <laughs> Uh, that said, he was always very gracious to people when they'd stop and, you know, say, hey, Jerry, you know, whatever, you know, you know how dead heads are. How did, <laughs> he, he, how did, he, how did, he, how did he avoid it? I remember you well, said Well, because yeah. he just didn't go out. You know, he would stay in his room until it was time to go downstairs. And I'm sure when he actually, you know, I assume they stayed in this Aladdin. We all did. <laughs> uh, but, um, but, you know, I assume he had a phalanx of, you know, Parrish and other, other road crew right, guys, you right. know, making a phalanx for him to get down to the, down to the backstage and, so he probably went directly from his room, probably in a back elevator, some back <laughs> route back there. And, uh, you know, he's just not a guy who hung out the, with, with people uh, before or after shows particularly. Uh, you, what's, what's interesting is that there were occasional periods when he did that. Like there, were, there, was, a, there was a time in, um, I believe it was 92, yeah, 92, when he, uh, he had a melt. He had one of his periodic meltdowns, and uh, I think they canceled some shows. And then he, came, he got on a healthy regimen, as he did periodically. And, uh, you know, he really changed during those periods when he wasn't, uh, you know, abusing hard drugs. And he, and he would do things like, you know, after the show, people would, like, find him hanging out in, in the bar of the hotel and stuff like that and swapping stories and all that kind of stuff. So it really, I mean, the drugs really did create a certain distance between him and the rest of the world. And I think it's something that made him feel more comfortable. But on the periods when he wasn't doing it, he was, uh, you know, a wonderful social guy, which was, I think, his more natural state. I mean... If you hear stories about him pre, uh, you know, heroin in 76 or 77 or whenever people start uh, really associating him with that, I mean, you know, he's just this garrulous, outgoing guy. And uh, so, you know, I don't know, it's, it's, it's always rough to speculate about why people do things and why they don't do things. No, I, I was just, it, I remember, you know, reading accounts of, of people um, you know, in the hotel room and then going up to Brent's door or somebody's door, banging on the door, they, they had a beer in their hand. I mean, it seemed <laughs> almost, it, it just seemed surreal that, that you're, 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 ba you know, nowadays you have entourages. These guys are in, really in bubbles and they're yeah. not even drug induced. They're just, yeah. they're, they're in these, and, and just to have that accessibility to be, and these guys were so human and so normal down to earth. 
I, it just must have been such a trip to do that. That's, but well, it, I, well, I, well I, what I always think about is what Eileen Law, who was you know sort of the, she was the chief liaison with the Deadheads for many years in the Grateful Dead organization. Sure. I mean, she she was there sort of from the beginning, and she used to say when they would go to the Fillmore in 1966, you know, the backstage was completely open, and everybody would just be sitting around, and you could just walk back there. I mean, that that's something I find unimaginable. Uh, because you know, by the time I was seeing shows, it was it was already uh, uh, I wouldn't say a bubble, but uh, but it was they were definitely less accessible. Uh, than they were. We we are uh, about twenty two past the hour, and, and and Blair occasionally with my jazz heroes, and you're my hero today. But <laughs> occasionally with jazz heroes, I'll I'll play a track of music, and uh, then we'll an- analyze it after. But I, I with you, I want to see if you can uh, pick out at least the year, Uh-oh. if not the date itself. Okay, Uh-oh. so let's let's roll this for a couple minutes, and then we'll come back. The pressure's on. Don't shake, shake down the street. Don't shake down the street. It used to be the heart of town. Heart of town. Don't tell me this tale ain't, no ain't got no heart. Tell me this town ain't got no heart. Just gotta poke around. Another shake, 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 shake down the street. Down. Used to be the heart of town. Just gotta poke around. Well, don't tell me this town ain't got no heart. No heart. Just gotta poke around. Don't tell me this town ain't got no heart. Just gotta poke around. Don't tell me this town ain't got no heart. Just gotta poke around. Just gotta pull the bell. that one out because they don't always do that you know call and response there yeah, that's a nice one i uh, i officially am stumped i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna guess cap center 1982 yeah nice yeah blair nice call you know what um it is 82 uh how did you know it was 82 by the way um i don't know there's something about the vocal that, that that sort of sounded like the kind of excitement he sometimes got into in 82 i don't know i'm not sure the, <laughs> who's, who's getting excited Jerry. yeah Jerry. Jerry. you know it does a certain edge to his voice that, that i like there. you know uh also uh i can tell by brent's piano he oh, had yeah, yeah. His, yeah. his sound of the piano was very noticeably different in all years which was really fascinating but um that one you were off by a month Oh, okay. Eight eight three eighty two Starlight Theater, Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, okay. okay. Were you were you uh, on that tour or no? No. So you know that that when I first got that uh, cassette tape, I uh, that was when I really fell in love with the with the Dead because I really it just sounded like a, a real laid back group of guys that was that really listened to each other and and it seemed like I mean they often talk about it being a marriage but it, it must be have been remarkable to see. Those guys hold up and really have uh, be a family for for so many years. Yeah, uh, I think they would probably downplay the family aspect. Well, I don't, you know, I don't know. They've always said, you know, they're they're closer than brothers, <laughs> and I think there's probably something to that, uh, just because of the number of adventures they took in the psychedelic world that sort of bonded them for so many years and sort of laid the foundation for what they became eventually. I mean, uh, they didn't change, you know, a tremendous amount year to year. Um, 
certainly you can listen any year and say, oh, this is this year and this is that year. But in terms of their actual approach, um, how they approach their music and uh, the, the, the kind of jazz, what is there a jazz show? The, the jazz approach they took to, to improvisation, um, you know, that didn't really change much from 1966 to all the way to 1995. But, you know, they become better players. Their, uh, their songs change, obviously. There's, there's uh, kind of subtleties that come in and out and different approaches, different uh, uh, electronic effects, certainly, and uh, affect how Garcia plays guitar, affect how Weirs play guitar, affects everybody. Um, so there are things you can, you can chart, but, you know, essentially it's, it's, a, it's a jazz rock group, I would say. Blair, but we got two minutes before we go to the bottom of the hour break, and I, I want your answer to this because uh, I've never gotten an acceptable one. 4382, uh, North Carolina, first show where Jerry and Phil switched sides on stage. <laughs> why was, please give me a coherent reason in a minute and a half why this change was made. Um, probably, I, I don't know exactly, but probably has to do with the changing of equipment in, in some form or somebody changing guitars. Phil said like he that. could, Phil said he couldn't hear the, his, the drummers or something. He couldn't hear himself. I don't, yeah, I, well, that, that's probably it. You know, I mean, you, there's, there's a lot of noise up on that stage, so it, I, don't, I don't think there's any great thing to be, to be drawn from it. <laughs> it's, it's just something that happened periodically once so people could hear better. I hope I haven't shot down some great theory of yours. No, there's no, no, no. I was just trying to, a little filler here with about uh, 30 seconds left. We're, folks, we're talking to Blair Jackson, author of Garcia, An American Life, the definitive biography of Jerry Garcia. Blair, hang tight. Um, we're going to come back on the uh, the other nope. side and do, uh, and do a whole lot more analysis uh, on, on the back side, okay? All right, great. All right, we'll be back in just a little bit. Kenny Powell on the drums and Brother Larry McDonald on the bottom. Bum, bum, go on. Bum, bum, go on. Bum, bum, go on, got me. Bum, bum, go on, Brother Ed Brady on the bass. CNN Radio, I'm Stan Case. Name a major city and there's a good chance protesters there are taking part in the Occupy movement that began with Occupy Wall Street in New York. Cities all over the world have been drawn in. The protest in Rome turned ugly. Police say anarchists infiltrated the peaceful demonstrators in Rome, setting cars and a government building on fire. In Washington, the Reverend Al Sharpton led a march and rally urging Congress to pass the president's jobs bill or face the consequences at the polls. When you mess with our Social Security, this is not about Obama, this is about my mama. Sharpton says it's time to take the country back for the people. Prison officials in northeast Mexico say 20 inmates were killed Saturday in an early morning fight. Police were called in to help prison officials restore order. The most trusted name in news. This is CNN Radio. At Advance Auto Parts, we don't do anything just part way. We go full throttle. We don't just sell batteries. We'll test them fast and free on most vehicles. If the best way to test your battery was to place our tongues directly on your old battery, we'd do it. But we have a machine that's far more accurate. Need a new battery? We'll install it free with purchase using our hands. No machine can replace those. Service is our best part. <sighs> Intimidating investment terms multiplied by mixed equities and mutual fund things I don't understand, divided by the need to invest, minus insight to make wise decisions, plus frustration of market uncertainty, carry the confusion equals... What the heck is a P.E. ratio? When you invest okay. with Thrive in Asset Management, we do all the homework so you don't have to. Put our experts to work for you by visiting Thrivent.com. Securities offered through Thrive in Investment Management, Inc., member FINRA and CIPIC. For a limited time, you can add the OnStar FMV mirror to your car for only $199. It's like having a portable nav, a roadside assistance plan, Bluetooth, and a stolen vehicle system. 
plus automatic help in a crash. And it's compatible with most cars. Add OnStar FMV to your car at Best Buy for only $199 MSRP after instant rebate. Tax, installation, and OnStar subscription extra. Visit OnStar.com for availability, limitations, details, and more retailers. Hurry. Offer ends October 31st, 2011. At Advance Auto Parts, we don't do anything just part way. We go full throttle. We won't just sell you a few cans of oil. No, we'll sell you a five-plus quarts junk a Valvoline conventional motor oil for just $13.99 after $7 mail-in rebate. Then... We'll throw in a pure later classic oil filter free. If wrestling a live bear would help us get you a better deal, we'd do it while wearing salmon cologne. Service is our best part. Pre-rebate price $20.99. See store for details. Folks, this is Jake Feinberg. When it came time to decide where to buy my daughter a piano last year, the choice was easy. We got it at Hackenberg & Sons Piano Company. Located at 4333 East Broadway Boulevard, Hackenberg & Sons is Tucson's longest-running family-owned piano business. Run by three brothers and a son, they pride themselves on superior instruments and customer satisfaction. It's why they've been around so long. And it's why their pianos are used at the University of Arizona, Pima Community College, and many other prestigious institutions. So whether it's for your child, business, or yourself, when you buy a piano, make sure you go to Hackenberg & Sons. It'll be the beginning of a long-lasting partnership. For more information, visit them at HackenbergPiano.com. Folks, this is Jake Feinberg. As a passionate consumer of vinyl records, I value the art of collecting and archiving. So I have marked my calendar for Sunday, November 6th for the 7th Annual Tucson Record Show, located at Las Casuitas Event Center at I-10 in Grand. The show features vinyl collectors and dealers from all over the state. Doors open at 9 a.m. and tables are available for rent, but space is running out fast. For more information, contact Bruce Smith at 622-0104. The 7th Annual Tucson Record Show, 1365 West Grant and I-10, Sunday, November 7th. It's time to dig and get dirty. Don't miss it. Even the ancient Romans knew that music can soothe the savage beast. But what if there's a beast lurking in your old stereo? Maybe it's popping static, garbled distortion, a skip in the record, or worse, dead silence. Stereo Hospital can restore smooth sound to your receiver, amp, turntable, CD player, or speakers. At the same Midtown location, 4044 East Speedway for 10 years, Stereo Hospital might be the last shop in town doing quick, guaranteed repairs on vintage and modern stereos. Owner Jeff Brucker has over 40 years' experience as an electronic technician, and he is happy to bring back the joy and memories only your music collection provides. Log on to StereoHospital.com or call 722-4610 or just bring that mean old stereo in today. Stereo Hospital at 4044 East Speedway inside Metronome Music near Alvernon to calm the beast. Folks, this is Jake Feinberg. One of the first things I wanted to do when I moved to Tucson was find authentic Chinese cuisine. After a tip from the Chinese Student Association, I headed over to Badar Chinese Restaurant. Well... It's been seven years, and I have never looked back. Located at 7321 East Broadway Boulevard, Badar has been a family-run operation since 1992. The award-winning chef produces succulent dishes from sizzling ginger chicken to salt and pepper shrimp. The thing that separates Badar from the rest is that the chef procures ancient oriental dishes with the exotic island flair of Taiwan. Most importantly, there are no gimmicks or razzle-dazzle at Badar. You won't find any flat-screen TVs or karaoke machines. Badar is a place to go enjoy good food and spend time with your family. It exudes peace and tranquility after a long week of work. So come down and check out Badar Chinese Restaurant. Hong Hao Chu, it's that good. If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Be a part of a new coalition with Jake Feinberg. The second half of my show starts right now. Welcome back, everybody, to the Jake Feinberg Show. Joined here by author Blair Jackson. Blair, welcome back. Thanks. You're, you're quite the pitch man out there, aren't you? <laughs> Folks. How about, if I, how about if I order some Mugu Gaitan and a vinyl copy of Sketches of Spain? It's on the way. It is yeah. on the way, man. That, that's beautiful. It's I, funny. You know, I wrote a, uh, a blog not too long ago about uh, 
sort of remembering vinyl, because I, I, I really don't play vinyl records, but my kids are totally into it. They're 17 and 21. They took all my old stuff, and it's, when I walk by my daughter's room, it's so funny to hear, like, you know, weather report or something coming out of there. And, That's, uh, now, I, I, I just have a question for you. What is it, are they, is it the, what are they fascinated most about? Who? The vinyl, well, your kids. Um, I don't know. They, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, I, don't, I don't think it's just a sonic thing like it is with most audiophiles who really think that, you know, analog is the greatest thing and the, the warmth of, of analog and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I, I don't think there's any question that if you've got a really great component, component system and really good records, it sounds, sounds great. But I had kind of a mediocre system and a lot of records with skips and scratches. Mm -hmm. But they love it just, uh, just I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they like the archaicness of it or... You know, it's a, the physical thing of a record is such a cool thing. You know, the size of it, and, that, and sitting there with the album cover in your lap and reading the liner notes. And I mean, that, that I, I can't tell you how many hours I spent doing thousands, I, thousands I, and thousands and thousands of hours. You know, there you are sitting there in in my basement in 1967, and I'm looking at the collage on the back of Disraeli Gears by Cream, <laughs> and it's this crazy thing, and you're just trying to feel, oh, is that Clapton? Is that Ginger? Bay? You know, it's just uh, it's just so fun. <laughs> I, I, you trying, know, to, trying yeah. to wade through Dylan's liner notes, you know. It's a, <laughs> you know, it's, it's true. I mean, even now I look back and, um, you know, all I do is collect vinyl. I mean, I'll trade in all my, I, I trade any iPhone in any day of the week for for uh, for my vinyl and 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 mostly jazz vinyl. And, and it really is the it's the photography and the liner notes, yeah. and then you pair it with the music. And of course, then you then you want to just get connected with the guys. Ironically, um, uh, not really the direction I wanted to start in, but the the. Uh, you know, Grateful Dead studio stuff never, ever captured the live sound of the band, and I can't think of another band in the history of American music where that was the case. Yeah, you're, you're completely right, and they always they always complained about it. I mean, I, I think I think Dead records aren't as bad as they said they were, <laughs> but they weren't as good as they were live, for sure. But, there, you know, there are a couple of real gems in there. I mean, Working Man's Dead and American Beauty are, are both great albums. They actually, albums. They've actually, I think... As time has moved on, they've they've really because everyone wrote them off as really they they they're actually very like you said they're very reputable and I think they've actually gathered steam over time. Yeah, and you know there are a few other ones. Uh, Mars Hotel is really good, and uh, uh, Blues for Allah is really good. You know, beyond that, it's it's pretty dicey. Even there. You know, and they were certainly a better live band, no question about it. I wanted to touch base. I, I was reading your blog, uh, Blair's Golden Road on Dead dot net, and. Uh, you talked about remembering, I was so great, it was remembering 9-11 dot 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 81. Yeah. And I was like, this is great, you know, and because I... I, I, I got a lot of nasty mail about that, actually. Yeah, I, but, I, I mean... Disrespectful. Uh, oh, you know, okay. Yeah. Anyway, we don't want to, we don't, you know. The, the thing is, you know, for me, like I said, somebody wound up tracking, Garcia flubbed the lyrics in that Terrapin from 9-13, and I was reading somewhere where somebody actually tracked him down in the parking lot and and he was. They said he, he. They said he was so embarrassed that, <laughs> that that he that he flubbed those lyrics. But it actually that version of that song is is one of one. It's just so exploratory, and I I love the fact that the the band, you know, throughout the years, even 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 in their ups and downs, uh, they still they had they had a confidence in each other that um, they could pull they could turn things around and pull it together and and really make magic out of, of out of almost nothing. Not all the time. But well, it's true. I mean, uh, you, you, there's seren serendipity works both ways. You know, it can it can come out of something that that where all the stars are in alignment and pointing to a brilliant direction, or it can come out of complete chaos and 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 bad things. And when all of a sudden, suddenly get some, some somebody gets an idea of how to get out of it, and all of a sudden, the process of getting out of it uh, becomes the interesting thing. And I mean, any any person who deals with improvisation, and certainly this is in tr as true in the jazz world too. You know, you you you, you follow a lot of roads. That where you're not sure where they're going to end up. I mean, you can you can think that you have your ear and your inner mind on the one somewhere in the distance, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can find a graceful way back to that point. So a lot of the, there's a, I mean that's that's why we listen to the improvisational music because there's there's the thrill of the hunt, <laughs> and are they going to make it back? And right. how are they going to make it back? Right. And what path are we going to take to make it back? So you know I mean that was that was certainly it was always true with the Grateful Dead where. You know, they could they could be playing something that seemed completely inept at one moment, and then something happens, and it's, maybe it's a key change that one guy suddenly introduces, or maybe it's just a couple of notes that trigger something in one of the other players. And it's, if, if they're listening to each other, which is what, at their best, they were, they, you're doing with any band, and especially an improvisational band, um, then it can lead to some wonderful things. And I think that's probably true of that, that Terrapin you, you talked about, where... 
Yeah, the, the, he does sort of mess up. I, I, I listened to it not that long ago. He, he messes up pretty bad, actually. But, he does. But then there's this kind of little drifting instrumental thing that goes kind of goes in an interesting direction before they come back to, to words again. And you know that's that's part of the that's part of the journey. In in Phil's in Phil's book, he talks about um, in in 1983 road tripping with his then girlfriend uh, for the whole fall tour, the one that went from the Pacific Northwest all the way down culminating in Austin, Texas. And I, this is the question, this is the insider question for Blair Jackson. This is what I obsess about is if, a ba- okay, let's, let's say the band, you know, w- was going from UVM to Rochester. Yeah. How would they travel? Was it like a, was it a big bus? They'd all be on the same bus or was, was Jerry getting helicoptered in? I mean, I, I'm fascinated by the travel. No, of the I'm band. pretty, no, he wasn't getting helicoptered. Um, I think it would, it would depend, uh, on, uh, on, um, you know, in '83 they were still flying commercial for sure. I think a little later on, when they had more money, they they actually had charters that would that would take them from city to city. And another, another thing they did later, a little later on, when they got, you know, maybe late '80s when they were super successful, is they would tend to then, <clears throat> you know, maybe stay in New York for ten or twelve days and then you know use that as as, as the the locus point for shows in Baltimore and Philly and up north uh, in Maine or whatever, and then come back each night. Oh, I didn't. Know. Wow. Yeah, they would sometimes do that. No, no, but I just want to be very clear about this. The the early '80s, they were flying commercial. Yeah, I think so. So you, that was one of the things that, that Jerry really disliked. <laughs> I'm sure he could. Be well, saying. I mean, I mean, thank God security wasn't what it was then. What it was is now then, but you know, that's that's, that's a kind of, you're kind of exposed there, even even uh, if you're. Celebrity and all that kind of stuff, and, uh, but yeah, I think they were they were flying commercial. Can you talk a little bit about um, your experience in, in Santa Fe in '83? You said it was a very magical time, and I was hoping you'd be more specific about it. Well, it was it was it was magical for us, and I think it was magical for everybody who was there. I don't know, you know, whether it was more or less magical than anything else the band played. I mean, like for instance, I went, there was the first day there was there was like a, a sort of a cold thunderstorm that that went over right towards the end of the first set. Mm-hmm. I remember that that it was almost sleeting, <laughs> even though it was a warm. You know, September <laughs> it was September, day, yeah. September day, um, um, and they really raced through the China Cat Sunflower at the end. It was like the fastest version ever. <laughs> they probably wanted to get off the stage because it wasn't. They didn't have a covering over the stage. It, it, it was the stage was though was really beautiful. It was somebody in town had donated like you know fifty thousand roses or something and made this incredible. Uh, proscenium out of roses, so that that was really cool. Uh, the the place itself was just a magical place. It was it was the, it's the racetrack. It was the downs in Santa Fe, uh, so it was essentially dirt a dirt infield and then um, uh, the stands and all that kind of stuff. But it was it wasn't that very crowded and it was a beautiful day and you sort of see the the white clouds streaming across the azure sky and you see the red mesas in the distance. It was just it's just an incredible setting. Anyway, at the end of this first set, where where it had it had kind of rained momentarily and everybody fled, you know, ah, <laughs> um, you got this incredible rainbow over the back of the wow. stage, mm. which was amazing. And that, so the drummers did their entire drum solo under this rainbow. And later, somebody asked Jerry if he thought it's nah, I never left my room. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was more magical for some of us than for others. Uh, then the second day was just uh, it was an even better show. It was just one of those great shows with an incredible morning dew and help on the way, just the things you wanted to hear and. A, uh, uh, an incredible crimson sunset streaking across the sky as they were leaving the stage. It was just, you know, set and setting, uh, you know, in the old acid terminology, it was always a, a big thing for Grateful Dead, and that's why seeing them, in, them at the Greek Theater or, I guess, in, if you're in the Midwest, Alpine Meadows and uh, Madison Square Garden seemed to have its own vibe. You know, the Fox Theater in Atlanta. There's all these little outposts of, of cool places all around the country where it was really special to be there. And, and it's, it's almost like having the Grateful Dead play there as gravy because the place itself has its own weight and magic. If Red I'm, Rocks, you know, obviously, in Colorado. If I remember correctly, um, I think Phil sang for the first time in a long time during that Santa Fe. He's, That's right. He sang during, a Cold Rain uh, and Snow. During the Cold Rain and Snow encore, yeah. We were, we were right under the stage and shocked. <laughs> yeah, but a tri- and then Bobby, hey, Bobby, Bobby made a great joke, too, at the beginning in, in, in 1789 at Rain Fish in Cairo, Illinois. <laughs> and and then they busted out of women, and, and then a second set Cumberland. It was that was a that was a heady time. A lot of people, uh, I mean, it, it's I'm just glad it's in the record books. But you yeah. know, that, yeah. whole t- that whole tour was great. I mean, we we had actually started uh, the tour. Uh, you know, we had jobs. We, we both my wife and I worked for Bam Magazine at the time, and um, so we couldn't go on the road for two weeks. But we did 
take, uh, I, I guess we took a week off and we went and saw um, the shows up in Eugene. They played this tiny little place called the Holt Center, oh, yeah. which had just opened. Those were great shows. And then we drove to Boise, Idaho. That was the first time we'd ever been up there, so that was really great. And then, but then we went back to work. We drove back, uh, you know, over a couple of days, back to, and went did a, a whole uh, work work week. And then that weekend, we flew down to Santa Fe just for those two shows. So that, it was it was wonderful. I just wanted to spend a, a couple minutes here talking about uh, you know a guy who who I get a kick out of and and I always advocate for. He's 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 left us now, but I always felt that. Uh, I always wanted to meet him, and, and if, if I ever could, I would have loved to have had a couple beers with him, is Brent Midland. And <laughs> I think he'd like to have a lot of beers with you. <laughs> what, 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 I mean, can you talk about the when you first met Brent, hanging out, how he, what what were the positives? I mean, I, I always find his playing to be fantastic. And I, I, you know what's funny is that the first time I actually met him, like met him in the flesh, it was it had nothing to do with my job or anything like that. We, we ran into him at, at a restaurant in Oakland near the Oakland Auditorium called uh, Mexicali Rose, which is a place that was open late. And my wife and I ran into him there, uh, and uh, I introduced myself and all that kind of stuff. And he said, oh, hi, I'm Brent. And he's like, yeah, I know. He was already in the band at that point? <laughs> what? He was already in the band at that oh, point. Oh, yeah, this was like a few years into it. I, I only interviewed Brent one time. It was in 19... Uh, what year was that? 87, I guess it was, for the Golden Road. And, um, you know, he was, he was a nice guy. He... he, he He's shy, as as you would expect. He, he wasn't he wasn't an intellectual in the way that like Jerry and Phil and uh, even Bobby 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 much more intellectual than you probably think he. No, is. I, I mean that the book that you you worked on with Gans, the conversations with the dead. When I read Bobby's stuff, he's spot on. Yeah, he's he's very bright. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so they're you know they're all kind of intellectuals and they all have in, they all have kind of odd interests and they're interested in a million different kinds of music and this kind. And Brent really wasn't that guy. I mean, he was. He was a pretty simple guy from the, the eastern uh, East Bay, you know, which is kind of the outer East Bay, which is this kind of suburban uh, you know, suburb of, of San Francisco, essentially. Um, and uh, you know, I don't I don't think he really had he didn't really share any of the sort of psychedelic background um, that that the other guys had. So he didn't have that kind of backstory in his life the way somebody like Keith who was like a major acid head, right? Uh, <laughs> did um so you know he was he was in some ways he wasn't really on the, on the same wavelength as the other guys but you know musically he he fit in immediately and really well i thought and he was a really good singer and uh you know he i i, I always thought he gave it his all i i, I never could quite understand the thi- the 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 thing that he seemed to attach to himself which was that he was the perennial new guy even when he died 11 years later, you know, there were still guys who thought of him as the new guy, even though he was like the longest lasting keyboardist by, you know, nine years or something. Uh, it's just, he probably, I mean... He just had a, you know, he just had a, a little, conf- uh, he, had a, he had a confidence problem. Uh, I think part of it was feeling like he didn't really fit in with yeah. the other guys and, and maybe wasn't being accepted the same way as the other guys. But I, but I think some of that was self-created because I, I, almost everybody I knew accepted him immediately and, and liked him. So I, I don't know where it came from. I, it's, uh, that's well put. It's sad. You know, uh, and then uh, in, in uh, Garcia in American Life, uh, the 1984 ver- uh, section of the book is not that dense, but what does come across is the fact that the lyrics to this song uh, were perfectly portrayed during that, that year to describe Jerry Garcia. Let's listen to this. Uh, Blair, you're on, you're on cue again, okay, buddy? Okay. Here we go. So happy Do all the things that keep us out of this gloom Sing a song, play guitar, make it snappy You are the one that can make us all laugh If we do that, you and I got a cheer
an angry, angry Garcia solo there. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, that was uh, the... the uh, is that the first one from Red Rocks? That is, that's actually from Blossom, uh, Cuyahoga oh. Falls, uh -huh. okay. 629. And actually, the audience recording hmm. is uh, does it a much better justice to that song than that soundboard because sometimes it does yeah. yeah the audience recording i swear phil rattles the foundation of whatever that was i don't know if it was like a kind of like a spack kind of place but uh -huh. he was destroying things it was it, it it's uh and his bass is muddied on that on that board but in any event um you know i, I just i kind of just i love the fact that like i said when jerry was you know like you said the drugs kind of put a it put a distance between him and the band, but when he got on stage and and, uh, and and they were able to to get together, I mean, I I love that that angry ornery sound. And plus, Brent also I don't know if you could hear it at the end goes ha ah! right into the yeah right after that. And it was um, you know looking well, back, Brent definitely had a had a good a good interesting on stage relationship. I mean, I think if you you can really see it in the videos that that have come out like from the, some of the late eighties. DVDs that have come out. Of course, like this, yeah. Yeah, like uh, there's one called Crimson White and Indigo from uh, Philly in 79, I mean uh, 89, and another one um, shows it even more, Trucking Up to Buffalo, you know, where, I mean, he and Brent are just like, the entire show, it seems like they're trading grins and glances and sort of playing to each other and stuff. So they definitely had that, that kind of relationship because, because they also had that proximity on the stage uh, in later years. Um, so, uh, yeah, they, 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 I think they both, were guys who had a, a, a certain level of inner blues, you know, <laughs> and had their own demons, uh, individual demons, and, and, and they released it through music on stage in, in an exciting and interesting ways, usually. Did you have a chance to uh, interview John Kahn at all? Oh, yeah. Can you talk I about... I interviewed John Kahn 10 days before he died for, for my Garcia book. Talk <laughs> good timing on that. Yeah. Uh, talk, please talk about John. And I also uh, interviewed him in '86 uh, when Jerry was sick, um, and we were kind of floundering around, saying, "Oh, what are we going to write about for the next two issues?" When uh, Jerry had, had his coma. <laughs> right, <and> right. <laughs> um, he was like the nicest guy. Also, really smart, really funny. Uh, you know, I could, I could definitely see what Jerry saw in him. Just very relaxed and funny, and 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 smart and smooth and. Um, you know, I don't know what his deal was exactly with drugs, except that he really liked them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's a whole <laughs> school of thought that, you know, John Kahn led Jerry down the primrose path or, you know, that he was this bad influence and all that. I think they were bad influences on each other. I think they happened to like the same drugs and uh, really liked being together. I think they loved the unpressured, or Jerry really liked the unpressured vibe of the Jerry Garcia band. Uh, it was so different than... Uh, than being in the Grateful Dead, you know, where you have these, all these giant personalities all thrashing it out on stage every night before this unbelievable swirl of people, <laughs> you know, who are looking for enlightenment and right. God knows religious experiences from you. And with right. the Jerry Band, you know, you know you're going to have a good time, you're going to dance, and he's going to play some shuffle music. <laughs> That's right. Two hours. Um, How, who, who was booking? Primarily for the band, and I was gonna. This was gonna come up earlier, but you know, they like in '79, for instance, they, you know, they'd play MSG and they'd play uh, Boston Garden things like that. But they also played like at the Cape Cod Civic Center. Yeah, you yeah. know, like these small little hockey, the legendary games. Cape Cod shows. Of course, that was like kind of put Brent on the map a little bit. But it's like, yeah. you know, well, was it was it a conscious decision or it was just like, oh, well, let's go to Cape Cod and this is the only place where we can house them? How did that work? Well, it was a conscious decision to, to play Maine because there were a lot of fans there which was a, a great thing about the Grateful Dead for so many years. I mean, for, you know, for years and years and years, really through all through the 70s, just about, uh, you know, they were still a, a band that could play college gyms, and they did. They played Penn State, they'd play Cornell, they'd play all these, these, these places with gyms that seated anywhere from like 5,000 to 10,000 or so. But then, you know, they were so popular on the East Coast already that they would play the Spectrum in Philadelphia, Madison Square Garden in New York, the Hartford Civic Center, uh, you know. The, and then later on, they basically couldn't play any place that small. Mm -hmm. um, so that's when they were, the small places they, they played were then the places like the Hartford Civic Center and Madison Square Garden. And the big places they played were Giant Stadium and, and uh, Veteran Stadium in Philadelphia. And, and when they'd go to Atlanta, they couldn't play the Fox Theater at, after a certain point, so they had to play the Omni, which is just another faceless, you know, where the Atlanta Hawks play, I suppose. And you did say, like you said, uh, I forget the exact quote, but you know, it was, 
it was the setting, like the rainbow over Santa Fe or, or yeah. the Starlight Theater. A lot of it, a lot of the experience had to do with the intimate settings. I yeah. mean, they almost came to play at at those venues where you least expected it. Absolutely, and uh, you know, and, and what you know, a cool thing that's happening right now is that Further, which is a band I like, uh, and you know, some people don't like. Some people don't like that they have the the guitar guy from DSO, John Kadlasik, in the Jerry slot, mm-hmm. and you know, they think that kind of warmed over Grateful Dead or I, th- I think they're really good but they they are really going out of their way to play cool places and they and they, they do they they play all these every they'll play Red Rocks and they play all the neat places that the dead used to play and the new versions of them they'll go up to Eugene and play this new 5000 seat amphitheater called the Cuthbert Amphitheater last weekend I saw them at at, at the uh, at the uh, Monterey Fairgrounds for two nights and that that was kind of a, a neat Yeah they're cut, they're obviously cutting like, edge they're going like back 6000 people you know yeah, it's it's about it's about intimacy. That's how. Yeah. That's how. So it, it it lets us sort of reconnect with the music in a way that that was becoming more difficult as they played larger places later on. And I, I mean, I always hated stadiums. I just can't stand stadiums. And oh, listen, Blair, I I, uh, I just wanted to thank you so much. I, I hope we can do this again. It was it was a blast, and uh, yeah. Thank you for uh, you know making a lot of people. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely, my friend, uh, and and we'll talk soon. Okay, take care. Yeah. Bye. This is the Jake Feinberg Show, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next week on 1330 KJLL, The Jolt. KJLL, South Tucson. CBS News, I'm Sam Litzinger. The numbers don't look too good for some of the GOP presidential contenders. They're out with new finance.